Welcome to the Spa Girls podcast, a self-publishing podcast for authors. You're in the right place for the best writing, marketing and publishing advice, plus interviews with industry experts and best-selling authors. I'm Cheryl Phipps. I'm Shah Barrett. I'm Wendy Vella. And I'm Trudy J. And this week we have Catherine Lebeck. Hey, Catherine. Oh, hey. Speaking of best-selling Hello, authors. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for having me. We're super excited awesome. to have you here with us, yeah. Catherine. It's, mm-hmm. um, it's a repeat visit. Back in 2018, yes. we had mm-hmm. you on, so I'm really mm-hmm. excited to hear about what you've been up to um, since oh. then. Um, but Wendy's going to give everyone your bio so that we know yep. who we're talking to and what we're going to be talking about, um, historical fiction and publishing in general. Um, let's go, yep. Wendy. Yep. <laughs> Catherine Levick is a crit- critically acclaimed USA Today best-selling author, having hit the list over 32 times, just a big wow for that. Mm-hmm. An indie reader, bestseller, and it chart charter amazon all-star author and a number one best-selling award-willing multi-published author of medieval historical romance with over 153 published novels i mean oh wow yeah and in addition to her own published works catherine is the president ceo of dragon bay publishing amazon's number one ebook publisher of historical romance calithics reporting for the last four years which is hugely impressive Mm. Dragon Braid Publishing House has become known for its commitment to quality historical romance fiction and has gained a reputation as a trusted source for engaging and well-researched novels. Through her ownership of the publishing house, Catherine has continued to contribute to the romance genre by nurturing and supporting other authors who share her passion for historical storytelling. Welcome, Catherine. Mm. I feel like we should be cheering. Yeah, I mean, that is a bio, right? Yeah, right. I mean, just like... Yeah, sometimes it sounds so impressive. I think, really? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's all true. So that's impressive. Yeah, Welcome. that's fantastic. Thank you yeah, so much man. for coming on the thank podcast you. with us today. Yeah. So, Happy so here. Thank you. Um, now, so let's update. So, so in, in 2018, you had 93 novels. You had Dragon Blade Publishing. Um, and you were you were had also you were a USA Today bestseller back then too. But so what else? What did, where is everything at? What's been happening in the last few years? Aside you from know, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good that's a good question, and and it's it's more of the same really. But it's like 2019 when I was here before. That was kind of a a, a year. Of, it was a precipice year because we really kind of went. When I say way, I'm talking about Dragon Blade for the most part. We kind of launched like went yes. crazy in that and and covid you know as horrible as it was for the world it was really good for us and i think a lot of other authors because people were just sitting around at home reading and had nothing mm-hmm. else to do yeah. so yeah. we really saw and, and i don't know if you guys did but we saw a huge increase in sales which yep. which was really kind of fantastic for us you know if, if there was a positive spin in all of this that was mm. that was it but you know it's it's been more of the same it's been um continuing to learn about this industry because this industry is so fluid and it is so cyclical. And you watch it go up and down and sideways. And, and you hear a lot of misinformation. You hear a lot of good information. So it's it's just a lot of the same for me. But I feel like um, as an author myself, um, it is, again, it's probably just more of the same of that. But um, I'm always, always writing. And, and you know, we kind of joked about that before we came on uh, live like that. But I will tell you that when as you are when you're when you're a writer and as you continue to write and this is for everybody who writes your brain gets hardwired it gets hardwired in, in a way that creates these these schedules for you and it and it creates just a you know this is how I do it this is how it goes and my brain is really hardwired to write which is kind of pathetic because <laughs> I write so much that when I'm not writing um, I feel like I should be. Yes, and like yes. right now I'm I'm taking a break because I just finished the book for October. I got to you know get my November. I'm kind of behind a little bit. Um, I got to get my November book written, but I'm trying to take this week off just to kind of read yeah. and do a lot of business mm-hmm. stuff that needs to be done. But I feel guilty. And I think we yeah. all suffer that yeah. if we're not yeah. writing, we're not producing, we're not making money. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's kind of this, this self-perpetuating thing. So yeah. Um, what have I been doing since 2019? Again, a lot of the same. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> How do you deal with that though? You know, I'm exactly the same. I stopped writing a book and I'm like, I'm going to give myself a few days off. And in my head, I'm like, the book's there and I need to write and, you know, it's not going to write itself. And 
you know, my yeah. family's always at me to stop. I mean, I don't know. What do we do? How do we stop that from happening? Well, if you figure it out, you let me know. Yeah. <laughs> you, you might be asking the wrong person. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't know. It, it, yeah, it, it is just, tough. I guess it's, it's a good problem to have mm -hmm. because we're doing something we love. Yeah. And I think that's, yeah. that's the main thing is we're doing something that brings us so much joy. And uh, there's got to be dopamine involved in it. You know, you write Absolutely. books. Absolutely. Yeah, and you get on this high and it's like you're an addict and you want to mm -hmm. keep that high mm -hmm. going. So... Um, you know, it, it's difficult for me to slow down. And right now, um, you know, we just moved into a new house about a year and a half ago. And um, I don't amazing know guys... house. Yeah, can I just say? Yes, wow. It, it, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about it if you want to know about yeah, it. Yeah, it's it, amazing. Um, oh, my God. Yeah, it's it's but it's um, it's a 1932 historic mansion and it has oh, wow. so much work that needs to be done still. I mean, I, you know, I got it up to par, at least we live here, but, um, you know, I, I know I want to do things in the house, but my brain's going, nope, you got to write, you got to write. Mm. So yeah. it's, uh, it's something I still struggle with. Yeah. I do. Okay. How many books are you writing a year? Anywhere from eight to 12. It just depends on the year and it oh. depends on how much burnout I have and how much energy I have um and I will say that if it's a 12 book year it's usually two or three of those are novellas like for for an anthology oh. something <laughs> like that <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah I mean and I and I do tend to write big um like most of my books are 90,000 plus um the biggest book I have is 310,000 words um wow. but I I should have broken that one up into you know but I didn't I just kept it together so how are you looking after your hands? Yeah, I was just going to ask that question. Mm. My hands? Yeah. yeah. Are yeah. you dictating at all? No, mm. I don't. Wow. Um, because I've been doing this for so long. I started writing when I was 13. Yeah. So, you know, and, and it was practice. It was right. It was fun. It was a hobby. When I got serious, it was back in the 90s. And, um, you know, that's when you really start learning your craft. Because I really wanted to do this as my profession. This is what I wanted to do. Um, so the, to answer your question, um, I have a very flat keyboard, super flat, yeah. see it? Very, yeah. very flat. So, yeah. so everything is straight. I'm not doing this. Do you remember those ergonomic keyboards? Yeah, yeah where you went on the this? side like that, eh? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Those were horrible. They were <laughs> horrible because, I mean, the tension that they put in your, in yeah. your hand. Yeah, your yeah. So bizarre. Do you wear braces at all or anything like that? No, nothing, wow. nothing. I, I, wow, as long as, man. Yeah, as long as I'm perfectly flat, I'm completely fine. But what's interesting, this is the funny part, and this is only developed recently, but um, the funny part is that I, I can sit for 12, 15 hours and write. I mean, that's just kind of how my brain works. And I had a chair for like seven years, same chair. And all of a sudden, I started getting these hip problems. So now I'm like, oh, man, I had to get a new chair because now I've got hip problems from sitting so long, which is really weird. So and, and you're fine. Can't... The hip is crap. But is the new chair good? <laughs> yeah, new chair's fine. New chair's yeah, fine. I, I just, I cannot imagine how you can do that. I think I write a lot, but not compared to you. Mm. <laughs> so well, how do you find the time to do the Dragon Blade stuff? Like, are you yeah, fitting that in at 2 a.m. in the morning? or? <laughs> I, I don't Do you sleep? sleep? I was going to say, yeah. do you sleep? I actually don't sleep. No, I do. I do actually sleep very well. Um, right about 2019, when Dragon Blade really started taking off, I hired as director of operations. And I had already worked with this woman at my previous day job. So I knew how she worked. I knew how good she was. She's a real, she's a perfect admin because she's a stickler for detail. She's very, very sharp. And about 2019, I called her up. I said, are you happy with your job? She said, no, what do you got? And I hired her. So, wow. so that's how I'm able to do it. So, so what I do now is true CEO stuff. I'm doing the recruiting. I'm doing, con you know, I'm, I'm reviewing contracts. I'm dealing with the agents. I'm dealing with, you know, that kind of thing. So um, it's just really, she has taken so much off of me. And, and Dragon Blade now has, uh, I think we've got five or six admins and we've got 10 or 12 editors and proofreaders, and, you know, so it's, it's really gotten quite large. Um, How many authors but, have you got now? What's what? How many authors have you got now? Uh, I think we have close to 180 now. Wow. Oh and they're great. God. They're doing so well. You just, I see it all the time. Well, you know, we, there's a promise that I've made to every one of them, everybody who comes on board, I will do for your books what I do for mine. And I do, I've never, I've never not kept that promise. 
And because I, I feel it's really important in this industry of people who are just so fly by night sometimes, mm. or they don't care about each other. And, and especially with a publisher. Yeah. And, and I am hybrid published. So I've been published with source books. Um, sometimes, you know, you get people who just don't treat people right. And mm. I, that was really important for me not to be one of those mm. because, you know, if you follow that mantra and it sounds so hokey, but it's you mm. treat people the way you want to be treated. And that's what I do. Mm. Um, so I think it's just, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of collaboration. It's mm. a lot of, I mean, we, I brainstorm with authors sometimes, mm. you know, it's just, it's a lot of that because in this industry right now, you need people. You can't do this by yourself. This is not a solitary profession. No. Even though we sit in our offices and we don't have people around us, yeah. it's really not solitary. So it's really mm -hmm. important to have somebody who is going to mentor you because I was mentored. I am still mentored. Tanya yeah. Ann Crosby is my mentor. She's also wow. one of my best friends and I love her to death. And it's just really important. I feel that you have people that you can depend on in this mm -hmm. We've got each other. We've had this sort of group for sort of mm -hmm. close to 10 years and we're sort of, you know, we're all different, but we all look after each other. And I would yeah. I don't know how we would cope without it that actually. Yeah. 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 It's one of the Very one important. of the things that we tell our, our listeners is is mm -hmm. to find their people, you know, is somebody that they can lean on and you know who they can help as yeah. well. It's mm -hmm. so but I think we've also run into the people that will take advantage of. Oh, and, yeah, you know, sure. it's careful. You have to be really careful who you trust. And I hate to say yeah. that, but sometimes you, you really have to be. And and it's hard for somebody like me because I'm very social and I'm, and I'm very yeah. empathetic and, and it's hard for me not to just automatically trust people and make friends, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you know, I've learned hard lessons. We all have. Yeah. So yes, you, you need mm -hmm. your core group, but you also have to be selective yeah. of who that core group is. Mm. especially these days. Yeah. Yeah. yeah amazing good, good advice. advice yeah so yeah. so with dragon blade so are they it, all of these 180 authors they're all historical are they various like they're medieval and regency and yes yeah they're, they're different different genres but they're all historical romance we have become a boutique you know historical mm. romance we're, we're strictly historical romance yeah. um which is good for us because right now New York major, you know, the major traditional publishers are not buying historical romance at right. all. Right. So right. as a matter of fact, I just got an email from an agent today I've never met before. And she said, you know, I was referred to you by this agent and you're taking historical romance. Yeah, absolutely. We are, mm -hmm. um, which is kind of interesting because when we were children, we all grew up on fairy tales. Those Every are just group. adult historical, you yeah. know, those are historical romance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting to see the taste of readers changing. Mm -hmm. um, not so much our demographics, historical romance demographics, mm -hmm. because those are going to be older women, mm -hmm. um, you know, like 40 years and older, um, older women, but you know, you get the point. They're, they're older mature. Than like Gen Z. Yeah. 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 Even um, mature. So, I mean, it's just, I'm just, yeah, exactly. So, you know, that's our demographic and, and that's people that absolutely love our books, but in order to be relatable to the younger generation, in order to be sustainable with that younger generation, we have to, as romance authors, and his, as historical romance authors in particular, we have to be willing to be flexible and we have to be willing to make sure we relate to those those that younger generation because their expectations are completely different from the ones, the older generations. They're yeah, just completely yeah. different. Mm -hmm. So, and we're seeing a lot of that, like in Bridgerton, you know, mm, you, you yes, have the, yes. yeah, you know, it, it's, it's, it's so different. A gorgeous calliope of, you know, colors. I mean, it's mm. of colors. It's absolutely gorgeous. Mm. And that is just so inclusive and wonderful. And, and that's Dragon Blade really strives for that as well. We strive mm. for diversity in historical romance because let's face mm. it, historical romance is for everybody, you yeah. know, every single person. And so we find it, we're, we're really committed to that. And I think that that's important that every historical romance author be committed to that as well if you want mm. to be Yeah, I've written with a few uh, in a few box sets with a few of your authors, and they're great writers. Mm. You've got mm. Awesome, mm. awesome writers out there. Yeah, uh, so we really. We, uh, I was going to say, when you are looking for a new author, um, what are you looking for? Like, how do you? Good question. That's a good question. Um, you know, and I can I can pretty much speak for. I think all of the the publishers out there, at least the small press out there, but I'm going to speak about. Um, you know, what we specifically look for. And I think in general, any publisher is going to look for somebody 
who has who is is not only a good storyteller but a good writer mm -hmm. because nowadays what happened you know there's, there's those are two different skill sets mm -hmm. a lot of storytellers are crappy writers and a lot of writers are good you know good storytellers yeah. two different skill sets so you have so a new author really has to make sure they have both of those skill sets you learn how to write and you learn how to tell that story and you know hopefully everything will work out but we really look for authors who tell a good story and if they, even if they need a little bit of work that's okay but i will tell you that new york publishers right now they don't have the time or the manpower to do a lot of editing yeah, so yeah. you know that's why a lot of these authors you know when you when you turn in a book a lot of them have it edited beforehand before they even turn it into their editor and the i'm sorry their agent an agent will edit as well then they send it to the book. so yeah. you know we don't quite do that but we just really look for somebody who has a good story to tell. We're looking for Regency. You know, Regency's king. It's always going to be king. Uh, we're looking for Victorian. We love that. Uh, we love medieval. We love Scottish in particular. Um, right now, medieval is kind of taking a dive. Um, but but again, it's a cyclical business. That's what's going to yeah, happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So medieval's kind of just kind of laying there on the bottom. And, and it's like, I release a new book. And I think other than the writer mills out there and maybe a few other people, I'm the only one really writing English historical, medieval historical. Mm. Um, but I, you know, but I'm still doing well, luckily. But Well, you um, have a huge reader base, don't you? You know, that yeah, will invite I, I anything do. you do, you write. Yeah, I, I do. I'm, I'm really lucky that, that I've been able to build that. Uh, but it's taken 11 years. So, yeah. um, you know, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. But no. but Regency, I mean, it's always going to be king. And, and, and yeah. you know, Wendy, you know that. And it's, yeah, just, yeah, it's, for sure. it's a big one. Yeah. And um, so when you, I, I when you, say, you go. So I was just going to say, I will see, I will say that I have seen Vikings starting to come up now, which is oh, nice. really? I love Vikings. Yeah, yeah for sure. Who doesn't love a Viking? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if if medieval is, is sort of on the on the wane, are there are there best selling books that you've had recently that you can kind of look at and go, okay, that one was a bestseller for this reason? Can you talk to us about what what's doing really well in historical? Maybe even not just for the genre itself, but maybe also for its styles of writing or anything yes. like that that are, are popular. Yes, um, and from my from what I've seen from my perspective, mm -hmm. and this may not be across. Board, but this is from my perspective. Um, the things that do really well for us, you know, I'm, I'm going to speak to Regency. It, it does vary by genre, but I'll speak to Regency right now. Um, traditional, traditional, you got the wallflowers, you got the ballrooms. That will always be king. Yeah. What hasn't sold well for us, and I don't think it sold well for, for other authors as well, are the, the Regency women in unusual roles. Like you got a banker, you got a jockey, you got somebody who owns horses. You know, they yeah. don't do real well because Regency readers are very traditional. They love their ballrooms. They love their traditional settings. Um, I had a, an author who wrote a, she submitted a 1930s Singapore romance, believe it or not. This was pre-war, pre-World War II. It was gorgeous. I mean, oh, just really? gorgeous. But you know, I had to tell her, I said, you know, I, we're not the right publisher for this. Mm -hmm. I don't no, think we're going to do well with it. Yeah. No. Anything out of England isn't going to sell well. Yeah. You know, even Scotland is kind of iffy. I mean, but, unless uh, you're a big author, right? Unless you're a big author, taking a risk is is tough, right? For for a newbie. Like, um, you could probably turn around and write something different and all your people would buy it. Well, <laughs> that actually, that's interesting you should bring that up. I think that readers do love you as an author. They do. Yeah. I mean, they get attached to you and they love mm. you. Mm. But I also think they really read what they like to read. And mm. if I start writing contemporary cowboy, there's no guarantee that the medieval crowd's going to come. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they'll see my name and go, great, she wrote a new book. Yeah, I don't like cowboy. Yeah. That's kind of what happens. Yeah. yeah. So, mm. you know, that's something else I also tell new authors. Take a genre and stay there. Yeah, yeah, Take yeah. Take the one you love, mm. just stay there. Don't genre hop for God's sake. You will never build an audience that way. Yeah, yeah. Great but, advice. Um, All right, Trudy. If you listen, <laughs> Trudy. <laughs> genre hopping. Oh, anyway, we it's funny. I just put Trudy. out. A, I just put out one that sort of straddles Victorian and Regency, and I was terrified because it's a lot more mystery in it. And I was like, Oh, this is. Oh, how's this going to go? But actually, yeah. 
it's gone okay. really well it's yeah. because fantastic. I'm fantastic there's enough of everything else still in it you know yeah yeah yes yeah. yes yeah. absolutely but yeah so you know and as far as things like scottish you know that scottish is kind of on a downturn right now too mm -hmm. um just because the Outlander excitement is kind of going uh, over now and it's still yeah. going, I mean, it's seven years, seven years since that started. Yeah. And I think now people are kind of like, yeah, we're over it. Um, you know, but um, that's not a little bit of a downturn. Medieval isn't so much tanking as it's just kind of laying flat on the bottom of the sea, waiting to come back up again. Yeah. And it will. It's steady, but it's low. Yeah. Um, so but, have um, you ever written outside of medieval or are you just, you're the medieval queen and you won't go anywhere? Um, I have written a couple of Regency novellas, but they were for anthologies yeah. and it was great. You know what? Here's the thing. This is, this is hilarious. And you, and you Regency writers will understand this, but, um, in medieval, there aren't the rules that there are in Regency. Regency is just straight rules all the damn time. And sorry, I swear like a sailor. I'm sorry. I'm really trying to do it. Okay. <laughs> yes. okay. Must be a historical but, but, writer thing. Cause I do as well. <laughs> yeah oh, okay oh good 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 but yeah i mean regency is straight rules with with medieval uh it's not not so many rules i mean you have the, the traditions and the culture and all that stuff but not so many rules so when i wrote the the regency um the regency novellas i really felt handicapped because i i knew that i know the era but i don't write in it so you know i go every paragraph and have to stop and research I'm, oh i don't want to get this, i want to get this right you know so it was it was kind of maybe like maybe PTSD by the end because I was just was like is this right is this wrong oh, no. and because readers know out. right readers yeah. know they will email yeah. you I've had emails before from people saying well that's not right so I actually had to find the research and send it back to them and say well actually it is yeah oh yeah you know what it's interesting you bring that up because I had a reader send me an email once and she said you know what there was no carriages between the fall of the Roman Empire and 1800s. I was like, what? There's no what? There's no carriages. Wow. There was no wheel. Because she told me they lost the wheel technology. And I was like, lady, I'm sorry, but you're, you're, yeah, wrong. you're misinformed. You know, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. But they think they know, right? Yeah. That's yeah, interesting. But the Regency readers do know. So, yeah. so what, okay, so let's go back to medieval. I'm just curious. Now, now you've got me down a rabbit hole <laughs> okay so, sure what are the so i know i read regency and i understand and know the kind of rules even if some of them are actually i, I have been told made up and just from georgette hire making them up i could be wrong yeah. about that that's the uh, urban myth that i but what about medieval is there are there so you say there's fewer rules but what are the i don't know how, like with with yeah, what, what are, are the, the guidelines are the, you have, yeah, the guidelines you have or, to write within? Yeah, or what are the setups? Like, if there's mm. no ballrooms, how do you get them to get, you know, you know what I mean? Like, feast. Get a feast. Feast. Get a feast. Yeah. Okay. A big old medieval awesome. feast. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And tankers. And that's some... what you did. <laughs> yeah. That's what okay. you did. You know, it. but but you have to remember that it was, it was a lot less of a traveled world in England. I mean, you had your castles and everybody was, you know, a castle was where you stay basically. Um, but what's interesting is that it, the reason why I love medieval so much is because it was, it was the time period when mankind was kind of coming out of the dark ages mm -hmm. and coming into the age of enlightenment and, and learning and discovering. And, and there's so many fascinating things that happened in medieval times. Like, you know, Simon de Montfort really had the first basis of a parliament you know, governed by the people for the people. That was, that's where we got our Congress from, from him. Um, there are battles that, I mean, fiction is stranger than truth. Um, so it's such a fascinating period of, of mankind just kind of learning and growing and figuring out, you know, hey, we want to do this. We don't want to be like this. Um, but as far as rules and things like that, um, I had a friend of mine tell me who's got a master's in history. She said, you know what, unless you can prove it did not happen, who's to say it did, yeah. you know, and that, I kind of go by that. Yeah. And, and you know, and not to sit here and, you know, pat myself on the back and go, yeah, medieval's all mine. But the fact is that I can pretty much write anything. Mm. And unless you can prove to me it didn't happen, you know, yeah. I make yeah. shit up. I do. I really do. <laughs> and, and that's okay. That's okay. We all do that. That's what we do. That's what we do. That's what we yeah. do. But, but I do adhere by the, the rules of the time, which is, you know, for example, um, People didn't live together before marriage, you know, and that that's across history. You know, they didn't do that. 
for the most part, unless yeah. you love it. But, um, you know, just, just certain things that we still to this day kind of hold as as our core values, you know, marriage is yeah. important. But, you know, one of the big things with marriage back in medieval times is that, that's different from Regency is in medieval times, you married for armies, you know, so I want to marry this guy, he's going to bigger army, he's going to boost up my army because my daughter's going to marry him. Um, yeah. You married for money, you married for politics, you married for, you know, armies and, and military advantage. Now, you didn't really do that in Regency times, but yeah. you did do that in, in um, medieval times, which makes love matches much more rare in that time period, I think, than, than in the later, the later mm. period. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So there's a lot more of the marriage. Yeah, it yeah. does. It yeah. does. Yeah. Because that's Which obviously... immediately creates the angst, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I can see how that works. So, yeah. if, someone, yeah. so if someone was submitting to Dragon Blade, you what would be what would you say? Like anyone listening here now who wanted to submit to Dragon Blade, you wouldn't say come in a medieval. What would you say would you, that you'd like them to submit to you now? Well, we like to say that we look. We'll take a look at anything. Yeah. Um, anything that is from. I, I, first of all, I love I love the Roman era. I love ancient ancient history. I really love yeah. that yeah. Egyptian ancient, but but usually ancient Rome and ancient Egypt, you know, ancient civilizations like that, um, lend themselves better to historical fiction, like the Song of Achilles. You know, that's Madeline Miller's book and those kind of things. Um, but what we would really like to see are medieval. We'd love to see Viking, uh, Scottish, Regency, Victorian. Not Gilded Age so much. That's a little beyond what we do. We kind of stop at Victoria's death, yeah. um, you know, 1900. Although we will look at Edwardian because I love Edwardians. They were mm. yeah. um, but that's pretty much what we'll look at. Um, mm -hmm. The things that we won't look at or really kind of don't really want to um, publish are Civil War, the Civil War genre, uh, because that there is no way to really get around glorifying white supremacy and slavery and i hate to use those terms but when you're writing about the civil war that's that's what was happening right then that's really yeah, what yeah. was happening unless you're writing about the north which is a little different but you yeah. know it's you you kind of get into to issues with that i'm talking about the american civil war yeah. i i can't bring you guys you're in australia yeah. I, I know you know new about zealand. That, but... new zealand we're in new zealand oh, new, new zealand even better there you go yeah. um <laughs> beautiful beautiful place beautiful yeah place. Um, but yeah, so I mean, there's just certain things that you really don't want to romanticize, and we can we can talk about that if you like. Yeah. But as a historical romance publisher, there are things that we can't and will not romanticize. Mm, yeah, so, mm, that makes sense. Yeah. That mm. makes sense. Does, does uh, things like Bridgerton have that? Has that obviously affected, say, for example, Regency romance for you guys, or is that not? You talked about you know Outlander before, and I just was curious. Bridgerton and, and Wendy can, can kind of attest to this as well. There is a Bridgerton effect. And, and there are, because what happened was, is, is that Bridgerton became this gorgeous Shondaland diverse world. And it drew in a lot of the younger demographics who, you know, that's the world they want to live in. And it really was attractive to them. So because of that, they started reading other um, Regency novels. And I know a lot, I know a lot of Regency authors really, um, benefited from the Bridgerton effect. So yeah, absolutely. There's, there's, whenever you have something like that, Bridgerton or Outlander or um, The Last King or anything like that, it's, it's mm -hmm. going to trickle into the genre, um, which is better for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like I'm That's treating fine. on, I want to be careful here, but so, so with Bridgerton, the move, the the television program, and you talked about the diversity, you've got all these different characters of different colors and shapes and sizes. Do, are people writing in the books or are, we, are they sort of still writing traditional yeah traditional traditional Regency? yeah you know it, it's interesting um we are navigating a, a very interesting world right now and and i think a very a very wonderful world because it's like i said before romance is for everybody it's not just for the people who were, had books traditionally written for them. And, you know, I will say it, the Caucasian people, you know, it's not just for us. It is for everybody of every color, of every sexual orientation, of every creed. And that's why I think it's so important so they can have something relatable. Now, mm -hmm. just because maybe, a, you know, a, a book that has two male main characters in love, just because it doesn't appeal to you, doesn't mean you, you 
that's because you're not the main demographic. There are yeah. plenty of male care, you know, male couples out there who love to read that stuff. Mm. And and I think that that's absolutely wonderful. They should have that for them. Mm. So it's it's just a very different world right now. And and um, every publisher is really trying to keep up with. Okay, there are people out there who would love to have you know diverse romance, and we want to provide that. We really do. Um, so I and I think it's it's a lovely, um, important way to, you know, look at the, you know, look at, look at publishing right now. And, mm-hmm. and you can see that publishing is, is really diversifying quite, quite beautifully. Um, so mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's really cool. And because, and, you know, and I, I paint this picture, it's like, you would never make a stew or a soup with one ingredient. Why mm-hmm. would you do romance with one yeah. ingredient? Yeah. Don't, yeah. you yeah. know, it well, takes, but... it takes many ingredients mm-hmm. to make it flavorful and, and mm-hmm. successful. Um, yeah and if you think about it it, there was already for example and this is my understanding of regency feel free to you know is it like for example there was the traditional regency writers who had every little fact correct and everything was exactly as it was and then there were Mm -hmm. kind of ones who were sort of writing a bit more modern they're writing for modern audiences and there were a few kind of things in it maybe language that wasn't exactly how they would have spoken and that kind of thing and and there was the there's these so that even itself we were already writing things that were kind of necessarily exactly as they were in the time. So doing kind of cool, like they did with mm. Bridget and this kind of creating new characters and putting a, a new spin on it is just kind of another aspect yeah, another of that same thing, yeah. kind of modernizing it, I guess. Mm. I, yeah, Everything I evolves. Mm. Everything yeah. evolves. Mm. Publishing evolves. We all yeah. evolve. Yeah. We don't evolve. We die. We stagnate. We just die. Yeah. yeah. So this, this is an evolution and I think it's an exciting time in publishing to watch this evolution. Mm, yeah. And I think it's, I think a lot of people push back against it. I think there's a lot of, you can get the negativity and stuff, but I think you just got to roll with it. I mean, you can't, you can't change it. You can't change the changes. It's yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, I think that, that this, this evolution of diversity, it, it can be polarizing. Um, but you just you just you're right you just have to accept it push through it and you know it's it's embrace it Mm. embrace it Mm. absolutely absolutely and i think that that every every author out there that i know in publishing house is doing doing just that just embracing this diversity because it's important it's important to our evolution as people and as publishers and writers to to Mm. evolve with times and i think it's also important to to build the upcoming audience as well because you Mm. know without putting too fine a line on it a lot of the older audience aren't going to be here in another 30 years time so if you want to keep growing you know you've got to you know god bless the the younger generations because they are Mm. making those of us gen x onwards uh you know taking a cold hard look and realizing that you know, regency mm-hmm. wasn't all white bread mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? right, right, right you know it, it, and it, the thing is is that yeah, I think it's really interesting to see all of the research that's coming out now about like for example I'm going to use medieval now when the crusaders went with rich king richard to the holy land that was the third crusade that was in the late um, 12th century um, there was a big old road that went from you know, for lack of a better term, went from the Holy Land all through Italy and all up through Europe and, and it, you know, kind of dumped in, in London. And so many people traveled that road. And, and so people from, you know, I'm going to use modern day countries, but, you know, like like Libya and Egypt and Saudi Arabia and, you know, points further south and, and east, they traveled that road and they ended up in Europe and they ended up in London. So there really was a lot more diversity than you realize because there really was um, a, a travel path you know, mm-hmm. to and from. And then there was also the Spice Road, which came in from, you know, um, China, basically. Mm-hmm. And it, it cut through Mesopotamia and all that. I'm using super old words here. But, mm-hmm. you know, it's just, there mm-hmm. was more travel and more diversity, I think, than we realized. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. For sure. oh, that's cool. Awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, so let's talk a little bit, move away from all that kind of stuff and, and talk a little bit about um, your marketing and your um that kind of thing and your planning and that um that you do for I mean I guess I'm kind of interested in both you personally but also Dragon's Blade so it just 
let me know yeah which is easier or what you're talking about but so I mean I think Wendy has this idea that last time you told us you had no newsletter so we wanted an update on whether you have a newsletter now and yeah. <laughs> I don't know and and then um and what and do you do social media how does that all work for you are you how do you find the readers and how do you get to, in touch with them and all the rest of it that is the $64,000 question. <laughs> how do you find new readers and how do you reach them? Yeah. Um, I'm going to go back to what I said before, which is as authors, we need to always be evolving and always be looking. You can never stop. So um, I don't have a newsletter. I never have. I never will. I have a blog mm -hmm. and I, it's been better for me. I have far less unsubscribe rates. I don't have any actually. I have zero unsubscribe rate. Um, because a blog, for me, it's just a little blast here and there. And I do it very sparingly. Newsletters, you know, it's big, long things and they come mm -hmm. out and and so many authors have those. And, you know, you get a reader that likes five or six authors, she's getting five or six, uh, you know, mm -hmm. newsletters. And, and if they're sending out the newsletter more than once a month, that's a lot. And, you know, I don't do newsletter swaps mm -hmm. because when somebody signs up for my blog, they're signing up for me. They're not signing it for me and all my friends. So it's only me. Um, and it, I've been very successful with it. Um, but where I do share other authors, of course, is on my author page on Facebook. I have about 40,000 followers, so I share it there. Um, that's, so that's where I'm able to share other authors. But when it comes to my reader groups and my blogs, that's only for me. And, and my readers have actually made it very clear that's all they want. So, you know, in that case, listen mm -hmm. to me. Yeah. With and, your blog, um, does it do, you, do they get notifications coming to the email, or is it just they need to go to your website to see the post? No, no, it's right straight to their email. So it's oh, basically just email. They open it up, and there it is. Mm. Right. It's just so like a little blog get. post. Yeah. Okay. okay. And that's and what sort of things do you post about? Just about what you're doing, and I post extremely sparingly because I don't want to spam people. The last thing you want to do is piss off readers because you're you're blogging too much and they're like, you know, then that's when you start getting the unsubscribe. So what I always, always like 99% of the time um, blog about are my sales, my new releases. That's it. That's really it. Um, and how often so, would you do that? Every time I have a new release. Yeah. And every time I have a sale. Constantly, yeah. like once a month, basically. Yeah, pretty, yeah, 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 that's yeah. pretty yeah. much once a month. So yeah. that's, it's very, very sparing. Um, and I feel that that's really important because reader fatigue is a real thing. Yeah. And sure. they get exhausted when they get these these newsletters and there's you and five other authors on it. Like, mm. oh my gosh, it's overwhelming. And I think that, that we need to be really respectful of that. Um, you know, clearly we can't all coordinate our newsletters. So yeah. I, I just think that in this case, less is more. Mm -hmm. when it comes to blogging and newsletters and i think mm -hmm. if you've got forty thousand oh, people on facebook following it you know and you're you probably page, don't need it yeah you probably are okay <laughs> with that. so do well you... no it's it's facebook because okay so if i post on facebook on my author page if i really want good visibility for that post i gotta i gotta boost that post so i'm paying 100 bucks a pop you know to boost mm -hmm. that post if i mm -hmm. want people to really see it yeah. um so just because I have 40,000 followers doesn't mean 40,000 people see it. I wish, but. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And your reader group, you go live quite a bit, don't you? The reader group? You know, yeah. the reader group is very, um, it's very active. I mean, they are really active and they're really rabid and, and um, it's, you know, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to see them. Sometimes they know the books better than I do, you yeah. know, which is kind of funny. But yeah. um, I, I, that's the reader group is more of a one on one. That's me talking to my readers. And, yeah. you know, I do I do a book club there every month. I give them a free book. And then at the end of the month, we talk about the book um, and they love that. I always do a live video and we chat about it. And, and, you know, sometimes I do giveaways just for them. And when I do that, they tend to invite their friends. So that's a good way to get them into, you know. To, to get more readers mm. and it's your book that's the free book right you're given your one only me books. yeah only me i do have a Catherine Levesque book club and that is strictly other authors I don't do that that is me introducing my author friends to the readers that want to participate in the book club um mm. so that's actually that's been really really uh popular luck luckily um mm. because it's a really active group and they have a whole week to take it over so how many people wow. are in that group are they there's 2,500 in that group, I think. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but it's 25 good, I mean, Mm -hmm. good active readers. So it's not like 40,000 people sitting on their butts, just kind of going in. Yeah. they're very active yeah 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 yeah, yeah that's cool. it is you do get fatigued with social media don't you you're like oh what am i going to post oh you know like it's like after sort of eight years you're sort of trying to get excited about it and it's not easy here's my cat yeah look at my cat yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have you've got a cute cat though right i think yeah, yeah. i think no, the other like struggle a- the other struggle I'm, drink, is I'm kind of... drinking water today you know sometimes you just have to come up with with things you know and I, I do I do post about my husband um from time yeah. to time because he is he is a genuine nut job he is and so funny hey but he, those things you I, put I about tell him you, he is hilarious he's he sometimes he says stuff and I think oh, I can't repeat that I can't tell anybody that but it's so funny you know oh, he's God. just he's really crazy and he my husband funny. has no social media presence at all he thinks it's all stupid and ridiculous you know and um, a couple of times I've been doing live videos and he, he'll come into my office and he doesn't realize it and he kind of walks around here and, I, and he realizes that he puts out the door you know? <laughs> hilarious he's a, oh, he's a fun. Oh, but the good nice. thing about that is he won't even know what you post. <laughs> exactly. He, he, he doesn't know anything. I know I, I post all sorts of things about him and people are laughing and, and they're kind of laughing at him, but he doesn't know it. <laughs> it's brilliant. That's so sad. I yeah, think we've been together. That, a that readers time, are actually so. really interested or way more mm. interested than we realize in kind of the minutiae of our yeah. lives. Our lives. So, yeah. You know what? That's that, and you're bringing up a perfect point right there. This is something that us as independent authors can do that major publishers can't do. Mm. We can get into the readers' living rooms. I mean, yes. we can get into their into their house, into their hearts, you know, in a way that we could never do that before. So I know people complain about Facebook. Oh, I hate Facebook. You know what? Facebook has made it possible for you to do what you do. Mm-hmm. So say what you will, but yeah, you know, it has made it. So- yeah, all social media has made it possible for us mm. to do what we love in an independent mm. way. Mm. Did so, you? Yeah, they, they love my husband. They love my cats, and yeah, that's great. Did you venture into TikTok at all? You know, TikTok is really hard, and um, I've just kind of, I kind of stick with what I've been doing yeah. because um, I will admit I don't want to learn one more thing. I really yeah, know. yeah. And, mm-hmm. You know, and I don't know how successful it is for historical romance, to be honest with you. Um, I, I know other, there's book talk and, uh, you know, we all know that Colleen Hoover took, took, took off on it mm. and, you know, more power to her. That is absolutely fantastic for her. But um, I just, I think it's, it requires a lot more dedication and I don't have that kind of time. No, so, that's yeah. exactly right. I was putting too yeah. much into it I, and I've just walked away now. It's too much. Yeah, it's it's a lot. It's a lot, but I mean, you the, but the potential is really huge if you hit it big. Mm. What about Instagram? Are you on Insta, or is it just your, yeah. your focus? Yeah. Are you, okay. Dragon Blade and Catherine Lebeck are on in Instagram, and I publish. I, uh, I post maybe once a month, every couple of weeks on Instagram. I don't really keep up on it. I think Instagram is is better for some things and not others. Um, you know, it's it's good for products. It's good for influencers doing skin cream. You know that kind of stuff. Is it good for books? I don't know. I yeah. I haven't seen huge success on it. So mm. yeah, mm. okay. But I, I like I, I, it's, mm. I like what you were saying about being able to connect with the with the readers. Though I think that's a really important point mm. in, in what we're doing. Are there are there any other avenues in, that you do that in? Are you what other kind of or is it mainly through that reader group and through Facebook and the blog? Um. I have my blog. I've got Facebook. I've got several Facebook pages. Mm-hmm. Um, I've got author groups. I've got other reader groups. And so everything that I've done for me, I've done for Dragonblade. So it's mm-hmm. kind of mirrored everything. Mm-hmm. So Dragonblade has the reader group. Reader group with Dragonblade is strictly for backlist. So we're pushing backlist. We have um, our main page, which is for front list, pushing front list and sales and stuff like that. Um, you know, it, I, I think... We have to understand, I don't think, but I know we have to understand our audience. And like I said, a lot of them are older women and they're not savvy on social Mm -hmm. media. So you Mm kind of have to go where they are, which is Facebook. That's what they, you know, they can figure it out. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know a lot of them on TikTok, nor do I do a lot of, not know a lot of them on Instagram. 
So mm -hmm. Facebook seems to be the best for the older demographics who, you know, purchase historical romance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can't speak to contemporary and stuff like that, but I, I can tell you that for us, it has been a better avenue. So it's usually my website and pretty much, I think I've got seven or eight Facebook pages, um, you know, not, not all Catherine Levesque, just, you know, different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. And what about advertising? Do you do Facebook ads or anything like that? Amazon yes. ads? Yeah. Yes, yes. We actually do uh, Facebook ads. Um, we do a lot of them heavily and um, they are pretty successful, again, because your older demographics are going to be on Facebook. Mm -hmm. um, for Amazon ads, the AMS ads, which are the ones when you pull up a page, they're at the bottom, you know, also recommended, that kind of mm -hmm. thing, also box. Mm -hmm. Um, those are extremely oversaturated and very competitive. And you can, it, unless you're willing to put in thousands of dollars, they're just not worth it. They're not worth mm -hmm. it because your, your ad is going to get buried under about 500 other ads. So mm -hmm. I, I don't, we don't really do those, but what we do do are the AMS, I'm sorry, the AMG ads. And that is Amazon marketing group. Those are the big Kindle lock screen fire ads. Those are the ones that when you boot up your Kindle fire, Got these big gorgeous if i had one here i would show you i have one here um but those are the, we also use those ads but the problem is those ads are incredibly expensive mm, yeah and they have about a minimum uh twenty thousand dollar um you know yeah oh. <laughs> I, I can kindle here i can show them to you but um oh it's not been charged anyway we do use the amg ads and um those guarantee you about three million um uh impressions so mm. there's a lot there there's a lot there but you're paying for it yeah um and they can be very hit or miss and you're you also have to remember you're not competing with just books you're competing yeah. with dog food and cars yeah. and oh, right. you know, mm. yeah and everything else so you're competing with everything on those um yeah. i've been running them for years there are seasons you don't want to run them you don't want to run them november through february because of the christmas holiday season um, you can run them in the summertime because that's our that's our big our big season. But mm -hmm. um, that's pretty much what we do. And then we also have a list of other sites like the Fussy Librarian and e Reader and you know those kind of things, Kindle Nation Daily. Um, so we do use those. We do use Word Media, um, and those do reach those do reach readers. So it's it's pretty much the same ads, but we're always willing to. Like if a new ad site comes up, we're always willing to give it a try and see if we can see any, uh, you know, return on our money. Do you yeah. do BookBub ads? Like not the, uh, the oh yeah, Thomas Land, but I, they, okay. But... So I we do the featured ads, but we don't do just the regular Labor, ones. Like yeah. when it comes out, you see that little ad at the bottom. Yeah, because yeah. those two are very, um, they're very competitive for what you for what you spend. You have to spend a lot of money to get the visibility. Yeah, but, but you do yeah. featured deals. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, if we can get them. But I'm telling you, they have an entire department that's dedicated to rejection of Catherine Beck books. So no, no, I've if, got that department. Oh, <laughs> oh <laughs> my God. Oh, 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 department too? Yeah, to yeah, no, that's with my them. contemporaries. I always get one with Wendy, but I don't get them with the contemporaries. Mm. I know. Yeah, it's uh, it's very competitive. But yes, we do we do, do that. Yeah. So okay. that's that's basically what we do. And that, that's stuff that has worked for us for years. But I think the main thing is making sure you're building up that audience on Facebook and on your blog or newsletter. Yeah. That's the main thing. Um, if Facebook goes away tomorrow, what are you going to do? Yeah. You know, you're going to, you're going to go back to your blog. Um, so, but it's just important to build that audience. Mm. Yeah. 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 100%. So, so let's, let's kind of step back a bit and you've been indie publishing and, and publishing with Dragon Blade for a while now. So that, um, what changes have you seen? What what do you think are the big new things that people need to be taking um, notice of in 2023? We're in, yeah. <laughs> Things change monthly, weekly. Mm -hmm. They really do. So I've been doing this for almost 12 years now. You can imagine all the changes that I have seen. Mm -hmm. um, so I think coming up right now, the big thing is artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. And that's what everybody wants to talk about. And mm -hmm. I will tell you what I tell our authors because, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, vitriol against it. You know, oh, artificial intelligence could take over the world. It's a terrible thing. You know, people have to realize that things like Grammarly, uh, any kind of editing program, 
a version of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. It is. So artificial intelligence has been around a very long time. Um, I don't accept books. Uh, I, I should say Dragon Blade does not accept books that are written by artificial intelligence, but I will accept books that you run through Grammarly. You know, as long as you read it, you wrote it, and they're just checking it, I'm fine with that because you wrote it, human generated. I'm fine with that. But as far as book covers and things like that, as long as it is ethically done, meaning, you know, when you do an, an, an AI cover, you have to feed other images into the program and then it kind of spits out mm. a conglomeration of what you fed into it. As long as you have ethically purchased those images and it yeah. is licensed appropriate for artificial intelligence, then, okay, if you want to do that, that's your bag, that's your deal. Because Photoshop, that's a form of artificial intelligence and that's what they all use, all the graphic mm -hmm. art. Mm -hmm. So you just, you have to, as long as it is ethically done, mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have a problem with it. Now, I, am I gonna use it um, for my covers? I've had a couple of, here's the thing. I've got 152 covers. I have more than that, but but you know, publishing we have run out of guys to put on my covers. Mm. So, so, you know, my cover artist, who's Kim Killian, who's been in the business for a very long time, she has her own photography business. So she uses the people that she's, you know, the images that she has taken and she's already paid these guys. They've already made their money. So she uses those to kind of create the Frankenstein, that the Frankenstein guys that we, we have on the covers. I don't have a problem with that because everybody's been paid and everything yeah, is legally, yeah, yeah. you know, there's licenses for everything. Yeah. Um, so we've, we've used a couple because I have to, I, otherwise, you know, I'm going to be pulling the homeless guy off the corner and say, hey, come pull my book. <laughs> you know? So no, yeah. as long as it's ethically done, I have no problem with artificial intelligence, but I think it needs to be carefully monitored and, you know, very carefully uh, managed. Mm -hmm. I do. I, but um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's one thing that's coming up now is, you mm -hmm. know, artificial intelligence. Um, I think we're seeing a lot of, let's talk about book covers now, something else on book covers. We're all seeing those cartoonish book covers, you know, little, it's a little drawing of a man and a woman, you know, and it looks mm -hmm. like a cartoon. We're all seeing that. Um, do I like those? For me personally, no, that's not my brand. I don't like those. But for a Regency rom-com, they're, they're great. But we are seeing a lot of those. We're seeing a lot of those covers right now. Mm -hmm. um, but as I far just as... gave a cover like that to Wendy yesterday. A book was mm. like that. Yeah, did you? Read. Yeah, a book, a book to read. Yeah, yeah, I gave her a book to read. Yeah. I, they are everywhere, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They really are everywhere. And if you look on like Amazon's list of editors' picks, straight covers like that. Yeah, there are no longer any guys on it, uh, or you know, or women or whatever. Um, so, mm. so you know, that brings up another question: Do covers like that take jobs away from the cover models? Mm. Yeah, they kind of mm. do, but mm. you know, it's it's a never changing industry, and mm. and um, that's kind of what what people seem to like now. Mm. And people um, jump but, jump from a great height on you if they know that you're anything to do with AI. I mean, I think that once that settles down a bit, it'll be it'll be better. But you know, on Facebook, everyone's just like flashing out all this. I will never, you know, like. But it's mm. just way of the future, right? I just I think that people just need to be very well informed. Yeah, yes. and they need to under they That's need to the understand issue, how it? it's used. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of the stuff that we see sometimes is a knee jerk reaction to this yeah. information, mm -hmm. yeah. and you know that's what you're seeing. So I think that as long as everybody understands how it is used mm -hmm. and it is it is ethically used, yeah, you know there should be no problem with it. But you're also seeing people going, "Wow, there's AI generated books now being uploaded to Amazon." Mm -hmm. um, you know that's something that I think Amazon is really trying to deal with. Uh, yeah. I don't know more than that, but I yeah. think they are trying to deal with it. Mm. Um, but as far as thing, you know, looking into the future, it's hard to look into the future. It really yeah. is. I can just tell mm. you what I see coming up, mm. um, and and but I can't really say what's going to happen five years from now. Mm. I wish I could. Boy, that yeah. would be great if I could. <laughs> I think but we'd I also all like think that. Particularly for <clears throat> romance, you know, and we've all seen this because we've all been involved in the romance community for decades, all of us as readers as well as writers. And you see things like you're saying medieval is there at the moment, you know, before it goes yeah. back there. I've seen the same. I'm a, a paranormal reader. You know, mm -hmm. vampires are huge. Vampires you can't sell. You know, yeah. it's everything yeah. is cyclical, right? Or cyclical. It really is. <laughs> yeah. Everything is cyclical. So, so what's popular today may be 
crap tomorrow and then something mm -hmm. else is going to be popular. But you know what? That's human nature. Yeah. Nothing mm -hmm. is constant. No, and no. you just have to learn to, to roll with it. Mm -hmm. Are you, do you remember um, do you remember in the 1990s or 1999 when everyone was freaked out about um turning to 2000 and yeah, it was yeah. going to like ruin all the clocks and everything was going to be a disaster <laughs> it wasn't and we the were... ruining the clocks it was the planes falling out of the sky yeah yeah go share what are you going to say um well i just want to are you um ku or wide oh i'm all ku mm -hmm. okay we are so, all ku I so the, uh, therefore you you don't you can't have a store or you do have a store uh no direct sale. uh well uh you mean a store what, like, like shopify like you shopify, know, shopify, everyone's you know, getting shopify stores these or days or your paperbacks and that sort of thing direct sales to customers. direct sales yeah direct sales mm -hmm. okay let's talk a little bit about direct sales mm -hmm. and this is this is only my opinion mm -hmm. but I know for some people it works and some people like it because they can avoid Amazon's 30%, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever it is for them. Um, but my opinion is why would you sell direct and maybe sell, to, you know, and also depends on your readership. You know, why would you mm -hmm. sell direct when you can go to Amazon and you can have millions literally millions of people looking at your book because there will not be millions of people on your website i promise mm -hmm. you that and i don't care if your name is you know if you're a huge marquee name you're not having millions of hits mm -hmm. so for me personally i would rather be where i know there's going to be millions of eyes on my books and not everybody's going to buy but at least i've got that opportunity and i'm getting more sales than i would if it was just direct sale that's hard direct sales is hard because you are you are managing that whole thing and you know at least this way with amazon they've got a wide platform that's global and you're picking up all of these global readers and i don't know i just i i'm just not an advocate of direct sales quite honestly mm -hmm. so i have been in kindle unlimited since before it was kindle unlimited i went in in 2012 when it was kdp select mm -hmm. and you go into kdp select and it was still kind of the same rules, but then in July 20, 2015, it changed to Kindle Unlimited. And then that's when they were paying, um, well, before that, they were paying by the book. So mm -hmm. the scammers were coming in with these, you know, 15 page yes, books, making yes. the same as I was with my 40, 400 page books. And then in July of 20, 2015, they changed it to the per pages, which is so much more fair. Um, but I'll tell you quite <laughs> honestly, um, Amazon and Kindle Unlimited have been really, really good to me. And they have been really, really good to my publishing company. They've been good to my authors. You know, I've got authors that were able to quit their jobs and write full time because of what they're making at Kindle Unlimited. I was able to quit my horrible day job and work full, you know, and, and mm. write for a living because mm. of Kindle Unlimited. Um, I just, you know, Amazon is, and I know everybody, not everybody, but you know, a lot of people don't have a lot of good things to say about it. But I do because mm. it's changed my life mm. and it's changed the life of many, many people. And um, this is a business and we go where the money is and the money for us is in Kendall Unlimited and we've had very good luck. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think it's, it, was, yeah. it, it was also can be genre specific, can't it, KU? I think some genres do better in KU than others, right? Yeah. Like, for example, um, historical fiction doesn't tend to do really well in KU, but. Yeah. Historical romance is hugely well in KU. Mm. Um, romance in general does hugely well in KU. So, mm. you know, I've had a lot of authors ask me, you know, should I try KU? Yes, yes, give it a try. Mm. But but you have to remember, it's just like any other platform. It's going to take time to build that audience. You mm. can't put it in there for 90 days, you know, because it has 90 day terms. And at the end of 90 days, you're not making a million bucks. And you're upset. It's not working. So you're going wide again. <laughs> yeah. Stay in it for a year at the minimum. You know, just yeah. you got to stay in it and you got to give it time to build. But, you know, for a lot of people that I know, it, they do really well at it. Mm. So, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, there's stories for both sides, isn't there? Let's be honest. It really is. You know, yeah, and, and yeah. like I said, I preface this by saying this is only my experience. Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, and that is yeah. my experience. And for mm. some people, you know, it doesn't work. And and that's, hey, mm -hmm. I, I totally uh, understand that. And for somebody like you who's so prolific, yeah, it actually it makes sense because you're only going to one platform. If you were going yeah. wide, that's just 
Yeah. It would be a mess. Yeah. Yeah. It would be a mess. Yeah. 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 It's easier just to have everything in one spot. So, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. So, wow. so we're running close to the edge of our time here, but I want to ask one last question, and that is if someone's just starting out as an indie author and maybe thinking of historical romance as their, as a genre they have written in or want to write in, what advice do you have for someone as a, an experienced um, indie publisher in historical romance? What Where would you send them? What That's would you easy. Send? Yeah. That's easy. Learn your craft. Understand your market. Understand how to write a book. And that's that's the three things that I would tell them. Um, because I think... A lot of people, and you know, and let's face it, we're all readers. We were all readers before we were writers. Mm -hmm, and yeah. when you decide to, to to write a book, you you quickly learn. Hopefully, you quickly learn that reading and writing are two different things. They're completely mm -hmm. different things. Yeah. So I would really tell them just to you know learn your craft, understand your market. If you want to write in Regency, understand it. Understand the pricing. Understand the players. Understand the branding that's going on. You know, you have to understand that if you're going to compete in it. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, definitely learn how to write a book. There's courses all over the place. Mm -hmm. You know, take one of them. Go to Mark Dawson. You know, he's got some great stuff going on. Mm -hmm. So um, I would just, I would say that, but I would also say, I would also add, don't give up. If you want to do this, do not give up. Mm -hmm. I didn't. It's been overnight, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not going to happen overnight. Mm. You're not going to be a Colleen Hoover overnight. No. You know, it took her 11 years to do that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to understand this is, we're in this for the long game. This mm. is not instant, you know, this is not going to happen overnight. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. That's yeah. why we tell them. Great advice. Mm. Yeah, that's Thank awesome. You. Thank you so much, Catherine, for being yeah. with us. You're today. welcome. Okay. Be delightful. Yeah, delightful awesome. to talk to you. Mm. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. It's great to talk to you ladies too. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. And so if someone wants to find out more about you, where do they go? Where, where would we send them? Uh, you can find me on Facebook, Catherine Levesque. Uh, my website is www.catherinelevesque.com and that's spelled L-E-V-E-Q-U-E. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they can absolutely and reach me on Facebook, send me a message. Happy to talk. Awesome. Wonderful. That's so great. Thank you so much. And Sean, welcome. Where can, we, where, can, where can we be found? We can be found at spargirlspodcast.com, which has got all our previous 400 plus um, episodes on there, including, and we're going to make sure to put a link to Catherine's previous episode with us as well in the show notes, along with Dragon Blade Publishing and Catherine's um, links as well. Mm -hmm. And we can be found on Patreon at Spargirls Podcast if you would like to buy us a coffee or more. Yeah, we would appreciate it awesome <laughs> thank you so much again Catherine and thank you to all of our listeners um, for joining us again for another episode <laughs> of the Spa Girls podcast we'll be back again next week but for now it's goodbye well. bye 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 bye, -bye. thank you <laughs> <laughs>